We've got a great session ahead, though. Uh, David Kirkpatrick will talk about the economic future uh, of business. Uh, he's the founder, host, and CEO of Techonomy. He's a journalist, commentator about technology, and the author of the best-selling book, The Facebook Effect, the inside story of the company that is connecting the world. Uh, it was published in 32 countries. Uh, he spent 25 years at Fortune and founded and hosted its Brainstorm and Brainstorm Tech conferences. Uh, in addition to writing for Tech Omni, he uh, contributes to Forbes and Vanity Fair. He's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. We're excited, excited to have him here today, so please uh, join me and give him a warm welcome uh, and welcome to the stage, David Kirkpatrick. David, come on up. So it's great to be talking about the techonomic future of business at a conference organized by App Dynamics because I have, as I've been here and learned more about the company, I'm realizing just how much our vision at Techonomy, which is the company I'm going to briefly tell you about, which is partly where the title of the talk comes from, we, we have such a similar view about the future of a software-defined, real-time, constantly iterating world as the company that has brought you here today. So I wanted to start by telling a little bit about myself. This is the book that I wrote about Facebook, which I'm proud to say uh, is still the only real history of the company that Zuckerberg ever cooperated with. I was deep inside the company for a couple years, uh, and uh, it's sort of, it was a very fun project, and the guy just continues to amaze, as all, all of you, I'm sure, have noticed, and we'll talk about that uh, a little more as I go forward. Also, uh, this is Techonomy, the company that, that I'm working with, and uh, this is our homepage right now, or very recently. Uh, you see we have a st story there from our conference, which was just a few weeks ago, with a quote from Mark Benioff talking about equality in business and why companies don't all pay women the same as men. And that sort of values-based approach to the technology-driven world we're moving into is something we're extremely interested in, and that was actually the theme of our conference this year was uh, human values in an age of technology. So um, that's a little bit about me. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about how software, technology, and networks are changing everything even more than most of us realize. People in this room realize it more than a lot of people do, but it is something that is really unbounded in its influence on the, the transformation that's happening in modern life. And there's so many ways to look at it. I'll touch on a few of those today. So business, of course, is the place where we feel it day in and day out. Uh, but one of the things that I'll talk about is the whole idea of an industry, you know, the auto industry, the utilities industry, the travel industry, the hotel industry, these concepts are increasingly anachronistic and irrelevant because the nature of technology right now, knitting everything together, is changing the definition of business itself. And one of the reasons, which is also a big part of what we'll talk about, is this blurring of online and offline. Um, and the idea that really everything is sort of intertwined in new ways and the Internet of Things is an incredibly important illustration of that, and I think it's not fully understood in its depth of significance, although the word things is very misleading, and I'll talk about that. And I really most care about the final point, which is this idea that we really are capable of creating an incredibly better world. And that's something I believe very firmly and that I think also is at the core of this company's mission and beliefs, which is uh, one of the many reasons I'm happy to be here. And before I go further, I want to just remind you that I'm going to be up here briefly afterwards. If you want questions or comments, tweet them or send them through the app uh, anytime starting now, and they'll get on the monitors for me uh, when I'm finished. So why should you be excited about technology? I'm sure all of you are in one way or another. But I think there's a lot of misunderstanding abroad about what's really happening right now. And that's partly because people think it's all about money and getting rich and, you know, Zuckerberg giving away $45 billion is a big deal. But uh, it's really not about the money that really makes me excited and I think should get us excited. It's because this is what we can do. We can connect the planet, create much better understanding of all sorts, between companies and their customers and their employees, between people of different countries and different nationalities, even different languages. And 
a lot of other corollary things that are going to happen as we advance forward in this tech-infused world, like, for example, solving the energy problem. Uh, I really do believe we'll be able to address climate change with technology tools that we'll develop. Um, there's all kinds of ideas there. And ultimately, we will be living better, longer, healthier, happier lives. So I love this picture because uh, it's, it's illustrative of the degree to which the world is knit together today. And this is a Facebook image that actually Zuckerberg uses on his own uh, homepage on Facebook right now. It's not really very even recent, but it just shows at one point in time all the conversations happening on Facebook globally. And I think it's really important to keep in mind what a small world we are now living in. And, you know, this is partly why it's so small. It's not just teenagers that are glued to their rectangles of glass now. It's all of us. And, you know, I think one thing we get caught up in is the idea that this smartphone is it. It's amazing. It's done. We, we've got it. That's so crazy because really this small rectangle of glass that we have to walk around like this looking at all day is, is another crude technology that we will bypass as time goes on. And uh, so that's something that's important to keep in mind even as we see the magic of the smartphone revolution and all the things that it allows us to do. Of course, I just found a nice image of a cloud, and we know that the cloud infrastructure behind all this incredible application technology and, and the tools that we use every day is key. But the bottom line of this networked, smartphone-driven, cloud-based world is a world of speed that is absolutely unprecedented. And none of us in business have ever operated in this kind of environment before. It makes tremendous opportunity and tremendous challenges, and people don't really know what it means in many, many instances, uh, and I don't think most companies are moving quickly enough, which is a real concern of mine and a concern of all of us who see business as the tool that can really drive society forward most effectively. Um, but these changes are driving real transformation in the world right now, and I want to start at the highest level of how it's affecting global politics, global life. This is one of these many amazing photos of refugee migrants moving through Europe right now, charging their smartphones, because without the smartphone, they wouldn't be able to be leaving Syria, knowing where they're going, knowing there's opportunity at the other end, having access to their financial opportunity and their, their savings, communicating with their fellow migrants, their families. It's astonishing the empowerment that the smartphone has given to these people who are, let's face it, causing a certain amount of chaos, but trying to achieve opportunity in the world we live in, and it's going to continue. This is the leading edge of something that's going to be a global phenomenon for the foreseeable future. So this little, I still see actually, this seven or 800,000 of pe people who are moving out of the Middle East into Europe right now to be a very small number compared to what I suspect will happen globally as this empowerment driven by the smartphone really extends itself further. And obviously there's plenty of other implications that... Um, a tech-infused world has for politics, as Arab Spring demonstrated not that long ago. It's had a lot of weird ramifications after the fact, most disturbingly the continuing war in Syria, which started with Arab Spring. Uh, but the empowerment driven by Facebook and Twitter and smartphones and SMS um, that led all these people to go into the Tahrir Square in Cairo in early 2011 uh, and to depose governments across that region uh, it was really illustrative of something that really is real, which is people have power they never had before, and that means an awful lot no matter what you do. It matters whether you're selling shoes or whether you're leading a country. And I'm not trying to say that this is all good. So I wanted to just include this slide to remind us that, you know, the bad people use all these tools as well, and uh, we don't really know what to make of that. It's just the way it is. It's always been true that whatever tool exists will be used for good and for ill. I'm a very big optimist about the human race and what people's values ultimately bottom line are. But, you know, we've got a battle that we will continue to be in forever. And the crazy stuff that happened yesterday, I don't know. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening every day. Um, but this is the world we live in. And it's, on my, it, on my, in my opinion, unbelievably exciting to live in this software-defined, connected world. And I think it's something you all work with every day. I'm, I'm impressed to meet a lot of you and hear how you're doing that. I'm honored to be a commentator on it. But honestly, 
it's just incredible all the ways that it changes everything. But the problem that many of us have experienced, and I'm sure everyone in this room has experience of this to some degree, is that leaders of businesses have to really shift the way they think. And we do love the word techonomic because it comes from our company name, and I think it's a nice adjective, actually. Um, but uh, CEOs are really struggling to adapt to this world. Now, we've been doing techonomy now for five years, and five years ago, we had sessions called Every Company is a Technology Company. Because, by the way, we do conferences. That's the main thing we do. Uh, we had conferences. We had sessions called Every Company is a Software Company. Every Leader is a Technologist. We wrote about that. We talked about that. And it was kind of a challenging, slightly even controversial idea five years ago. Interestingly, it's not controversial anymore. I think Almost any CEO of any successful organization today realizes that the world's being transformed by tech, and they know they have to do something about it. And they're trying to do things differently. The problem is, in too many cases, they don't really know what that something is. Uh, it's really challenging to operate in a world where you can't just do things the way your industry has always done them. And I really do think it's important to realize we're in an era of the end of industries, that we don't really benefit by thinking of the siloed structure of business that has historically been the world in which we lived. Uh, I spent many years at Fortune, and Fortune really just was very obsessed with thinking of companies in categories, and it was very useful when I joined Fortune in 1983, but it isn't really as useful as it used to be. And this blurring of boundaries, to me, is driven as, you know, the awareness of the blurring of boundaries is driven as much as anything by two companies, which I think are really worth talking about a little bit, and that's Uber and Airbnb. And, and they're, they're, they're important for a number of reasons. They're important because, first of all, a lot of CEOs and other business leaders use them, especially Uber. But it's also important because they demonstrate that the insurgents that will disrupt an industry are by no means necessarily of that industry. They are coming from a completely different mindset of finding efficiencies with a platform-based model that disrupted an industry they are not in, whether it's the hotel industry in the case of Airbnb or taxis and local transportation in the case of Uber. And I think ultimately Uber and companies like it will disrupt urban transit even more broadly than just the taxi industry. And another big part of this is this availability of capital issue. You know, we've just seen the company that's hosting us raise a lot of money recently without giving away very much of its company based on the reports. And that's really a wonderful thing for App Dynamics and for a lot of startups. You know, and even tiny people with just a good idea can get money now, and that means they can attack whatever big inefficient profit pool is out there, and we know they're everywhere, and many of us work with them, but the fact is they're in jeopardy if they're not as creative as those entrepreneurs who can get that cheap money. Um, but some people have figured it out. This is somebody I happen to know very well. I, ha I, I love this photo, which I happen to have access to. Uh, it was taken by Dustin Moskowitz, actually, and it was in my book. And, uh, you know, Zuckerberg is an important person to think about for all kinds of reasons, and I do think one of the reasons are his values. That's a key reason that I was impressed with him from the first time I ever met him, which was in September of 2006 when we had lunch at a restaurant when Facebook had 9 million users and some PR person had called me. I was at Fortune and said, you want to you know, meet Mark Zuckerberg? And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, because at the time it was a college student thing and it was impressive, but you know, it was just for students and who, who really cared about that? So I'm sitting there in the restaurant. I got there first, which I don't usually do, but he came in, he sits down, and I'm thinking, this guy could be my grandson. He's, why am I here? Why am I even bothering to talk to this kid? And Chris Hughes was there, too, who's even younger looking. And, uh, and I was, like, sort of berating myself, and then he opened his mouth. And honestly, from the minute I started talking to Mark Zuckerberg, I realized this guy had a bigger picture view, a longer-term horizon, and a better set of values than almost anybody I had ever met in any industry. And he really reminded me from the beginning of a very small number of great leaders that I had the privilege to know as tech's, uh, Fortune's tech writer, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Andy Grove, and hardly anybody else. You know, those were the three really big genius leaders of the industry at that time, and honestly, uh, Zuckerberg really is, at this point, I would say, surpassing them in the scope of his achievement and his vision. 
You know, at the moment, Zuckerberg's only worth half of Bill, only half of Bill Gates' wealth, but, uh, but I am quite confident that's not uh, long. And in fact, he will be the richest man in the world, and now we know he actually cares to do something good with the money. But the other thing about him was the iterative approach he took to, to Facebook from the beginning. You know, he, start, he just started a product that he wanted to use himself, basically, at Harvard. And then they said, oh yeah, we could expand this to the Ivy League. Oh, oh we could expand this to other colleges. Yeah, let's expand it to high schools. Oh, maybe we should have let adults use it too. And one thing after another, taking one step after another with a very strong values-based approach has gotten him now to one and a half billion people on his way, in his opinion, to literally everyone. And I don't think it's because he wanted to be worth 45 billion. In fact, I know it isn't, and I know that's true for Gates as well. These people were not driven by the desire for wealth. They were driven by the desire to make a difference, and they have succeeded, and that's where they get rich. Anyway, uh, we can talk about him further because he's fascinating to talk about. But this software-defined world really does alter everything. I gave the example of global migration. Obviously, all these industries, we could talk about them one after another endlessly. But it also is going to be doing things that we could not have expected and really had no idea were coming. And this is one example. This actually is a, a spread from the magazine My Little Company, Techonomy, just published. We have a few copies here if anybody wants some. Uh, and, and this is an article about how the blockchain, which is the in infrastructure that underlies Bitcoin, could turn out to be the way that we solve one of the biggest problems the world faces, which is that the global poor don't have records of what they own. There's a Peruvian economist, Hernando de Soto, who is the subject of this article, who has argued for years that the poor actually have more wealth than is generally recognized. They have a house, they have a donkey, they have a motorbike or whatever, but they can't prove it, they can't trade it, their ability to operate in a modern economy is very limited. And he believes, and this article explains, that the blockchain, which is a distributed, uncontrolled database that is absolutely reliable and yet not controlled by anyone, uh, could be the means by which a record-keeping methodology could be developed that could apply to this problem. We don't know that that will happen, but even, in, right now I think it's, uh, uh, is it Honduras? One country in Central America is doing an experiment with this already. As I mentioned, he's in Peru, and he's working with some stuff down there. But, you know, the blockchain is incredible because nobody even knows who invented it. You know, it's a subject of mythic lore. It came along with, with Bitcoin. It was an, it's an anonymous invention that n was not at all anticipated. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff, and that's what I mean gets me excited. It can get us a little nervous, but it's amazing. And, and you know, the bottom line of all this is we're entering a new kind of society where software is knitting everything together in a new kind of integrated universe, really. And, you know, it, on the one hand, you can say software is increasingly everywhere, but our experience as human beings, as customers, as citizens is increasingly that really we're just living and we don't really feel, if it, if it works right, which of course is what AppDynamics tries to make possible, you don't even see it happening. You're just finding efficiencies in your life and getting more done. And, you know, the other way, there's a couple of ways to look at it, and I'm going to throw a few of them out here. You know, this issue of are we online, are we offline, are we in a weird hybrid? I mean, obviously, we're almost all increasingly in a weird hybrid all the time. Uh, and I just want to talk about some examples of ways that that's being manifested right now, the idea as from an innovation and a business model point of view to recognize that people's needs are to have services and software that takes them from an offline to an online world, and many of you, I'm sure, work on these kinds of problems, so it's no shop, but Shopkick is an interesting example of a startup that's basically helping companies, retailers, stay in touch with their customers and sell them things and give them benefits regardless of whether they're at home, in their living room, or in the store. You can see at the bottom some of the incredible retailers they work with. Um, Walmart, of course, has its own product, uh, its own app that does something similar where if you're home in your living room, you use it as a classic e-commerce app. But if you walk into the store, which is geofenced, 
the company, the Walmart knows you're in the store, the app knows you're in the store, and it gives you deals or directs you in, in, in all kinds of ways, is, ways that, that really can be very beneficial. And I think that's a relatively crude, actually, but early indicator of the kind of software we're going to need more and more. The, the consciousness of where we are, what we're doing, obviously we have a lot of that capability now with um, various GPS functionality, etc., but using it creative, creatively is going to be a big deal. And again, Uber probably illustrates this as well as anything. You know, it, there's no question that using this app in particular, and a lot of apps that we use day in and day out, really does feel like magic. And like I said before, CEOs who think that they understand what tech is and have delegated it to their CIO forever uh, use Uber and they say, whoa, why, why, why doesn't my company's product work like this? I think we all kind of now are starting to feel like after we use Uber, why doesn't everything we do work like this? And that's beginning to be a real problem. You know, taxi systems all over the world that want to stay alive are trying to figure out how could we be that way. And it applies in far more arenas than just transportation. But this online offline hybrid also has a lot of implications in the terms of the kinds of interfaces that we're moving toward, in terms of you know, how literally every system of society is likely to eventually function. This is an image uh, Microsoft produced to demonstrate what its HoloLens uh, interface, which is the headset that you see the woman there wearing, and I'm going to go forward and then ask to go back in a minute. This is the hollow lens, and can we just go back to that previous slide? But this image of the, uh, the woman sitting there trying to fix a sink uh, that she doesn't know how to do plumbing, clearly. Uh, somebody's helping her do it remotely, and he's drawing on his screen, and it's showing up in space in front of her right on top of the sink, which is the kind of thing that augmented reality tools like HoloLens will enable. This isn't on the market yet, but it's coming out relatively soon, and it's a really exciting and interesting technology that I think is really important to pay attention to. And I even think, actually, from the standpoint of near-term business and social transformation, augmented reality, tools like this, where you see the world with digital information overlaid upon it, is more important even than this, which is also very exciting. And this is a great photo, but this, this is a prototype Oculus device of their completely immersive virtual reality system, which is also not on the market yet, but quite soon will be. And as you may know, they just recently did finally release the commercial version of their simpler virtual reality system that uses a high-end Samsung a smartphone that plugs into a a sort of mounted uh, device, but, but this will be the real heavy-duty, total immersive system. But once we move towards this world where these systems are routine and it's coming very, very quickly, we are literally going to be able to be wherever we want to be. And that's going to mean all kinds of weird stuff. And we don't know what it's going to mean, we, but it's going to be very different. I do think that augmented reality may be more important, and we get a lot of attention toward Oculus because Facebook bought it, and you know it's virtual reality. But in fact, Zuckerberg himself, in talking about why he bought Oculus, really talks more, well, he talks about two things. He talks about the idea of, of augmented reality as if the same technology will be used that will be integrating the real world and the, and the virtual world. But also, he believes that the future of social networking is virtual spaces where we literally feel we are together with other human beings regardless of where they are in physical space. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that will happen, and it's going to be really weird. Um, and, I, you know, uh, but that's... that's why Zuckerberg was willing in a social media company to spend $2 billion on this little tiny Kickstarter-based company only a couple years after it had emerged, and now they're putting tons of money into it. And even big companies are really making their bets. I was incredibly impressed when the New York Times about three weeks ago distributed to all of their print subscribers in the United States the Google Cardboard headset, which you use with your iPhone or your, your Android phone, and it gives you a pretty good virtual reality immersive experience. And on the day they distributed that on a Sunday, they also launched the New York Times VR app, which had a, a migrant experience article that allowed New York Times readers, viewers, whatever we call them now, 
to basically experience what it's like to be a migrant moving across Europe, suffering all the challenges and opportunities and weirdness that that entails. And that's a very powerful way of thinking about journalism in the future. And I was impressed, and I think it's worth giving them a tip of the hat. Um, this is an article that I wrote earlier this year when uh, Microsoft first started talking about HoloLens and Satya Nadella was talking about this concept of mixed reality, which I thought was a very interesting word, phrase, I mean. And, and at the same time that uh, Microsoft was talking for the first time in detail about um, the headset and, and uh, the HoloLens, uh, the Gates Foundation had came out with this really ambitious set of statements and, and, and a very optimistic program that where Gates and his wife basically said that they believe the next 10 years will be a radical shift towards increasing global equity where we are really going to see a massive movement of the poor of the planet up the economic food chain, which in my opinion is going to be most it's going to be super exciting, but for all of us who come from the developed world and are generally relatively very, very, very affluent, it's going to be very disruptive. And I was realizing that word mixed reality applies to the world we're going into from an economic and social point of view as well as a technology point of view. And I, so I wrote this kind of weird piece that, that got a lot of interesting reaction. Um, but the, the other consequence of this is everything is going to be iterative. We just can't get comfortable with anything. We're constantly improving. You know, you know my uh, Amazon app on my phone is being updated daily. And I don't even see it. It just happens in the background. Uh, my colleague Josh, who uses an Android phone, says that he tell, they, it tells him that it's being updated every... I don't even know on my iPhone, but it's, I know I said it, so it just constantly happens. And, and many apps that you all are responsible for are probably doing the same kind of thing, probably with help of a lot of uh, tools that AppDynamics gives you. But that iteration is really a good metaphor for everything right now. You just can't stand still. You can't get comfortable. And I, I want to also just talk then to, to shift towards this internet of things or internet of everything as I have it on this slide, because I really do think that it is really sort of the ultimate contemporary illustration of this mixed reality of online, offline, virtual, physical world that, that is emerging that has many, many ramifications. And we have our, you know, illustration showpiece right here, an incredible Tesla vehicle, which of course is deeply connected um, to just remind ourselves that it can be very cool, the Internet of Things. Um, but it, it's also kind of weirdly invisible in ways that I think is not always uh, understood. And so I just want to briefly talk about a couple ways to think of it. You know, sensors that are stored lead to insight. Sensor data, you know, generates information that is stored and we get insight. We also can think of it that the Internet of Things is sort of the first stage of a whole process of rethinking business. And then you have, you know, big data, which is a phrase actually not as much in use now as it was maybe a year or two years ago. Uh, and I think Internet of Things is, is actually taking it over because it sort of subsumes it. But in the end, what it allows is to completely redesign our businesses. And I just wanted to show this list of companies that are obsessed with the Internet of Things, and they're not only tech companies, but pretty much every one of the giant tech companies is making their stand that this is a huge part of their future. Uh, but also companies like GE and Philips, which is becoming almost entirely a medical company based on Internet of Things related systems. Um, and so I want to just take you through my way of thinking about the Internet of Things, which for us at Techonomy is becoming an increasing priority as we realize just how central it is to all the changes that are being driven by tech in the world. And we heard smart things yesterday on the uh, Internet of Things panel talking about what they do. This is a, a slide from some of their materials. And this is how we typically think of what the Internet of Things is. You know, it's our... Uh, uh, smart thermostat or a door lock or, you know, it's something that turns on our refrigerator temperature remotely or gets our air conditioner on 15 minutes before we arrive home, that kind of thing. And that's real and that is the Internet of Things. But it, it goes deeper, it gets weirder. So just a little more sort of slightly novel is this Amazon Dash button, which I think is super cool, although I don't actually know anybody that uses it. But it basically is free. And you can get it from them, and if you mount it next to your uh, dishwasher or your washing machine or your medicine cabinet, when you run out of razor blades or dishwashing soap or laundry detergent, you just press the button once, and it shows up at your door two days later because you have Amazon Prime. That is 
functional today. Amazon is, they sell it for $5, but you get that back on your first order. Um, that's pretty weird. I mean, you have our house just like full of buttons and we just, but, but it's possible right now. It's happening. I mean, Amazon is an astonishingly creative company that's trying so many great things. I mean, you got to be, there's a few companies that are just making our lives so exciting. Um, I wanted to show this picture of Barcelona. It, unfortunately, I don't think it has any Gaudi buildings visible, although there is a picture of a Gaudi building in the lobby out there. But the reason I mention Barcelona is that cities are being transformed by the Internet of Things, and Barcelona happens to be a city that's made a really big commitment to this. A lot of people call it the most digitally sophisticated city in the world. One, one thing they do there is all their garbage cans are instrumented so that when they're full, they go and pick them up and empty them. Um, and they have, they have all kinds of use of Internet of Things to uh, speed traffic flows and uh, improve policing and the general governance of the city. And they're very, very committed to that in a city that happens to be just about the most beautiful city in Europe. Anyway, um, but then it, it, this is my worst slide. Sorry, it's a little fuzzy, but it, it's something I had it from. It's a Norway uh, project where they're tracking sheep using sensors, and it was helping them do all kinds of stuff. So there's a million ways we can use the Internet of Things creatively. I had another slide I took out about crowdsourcing spottings of moose across Canada so that they can track how many moose actually still exist and also help hunters in some situations or help people who are protecting the moose in other situations when they don't want them hunted. But, you know, you can... That, to me, is part of the Internet of Things, even when we're telling the, the wildlife trackers from our phones what's going on. And, and I include this slide because when... When Salesforce.com started talking about being an Internet of Things company, I was scratching my head, and I know Salesforce very well. However, I just didn't get it. What do they mean? Why are they calling themselves that? And then at our recent conference, uh, Mark Benioff and one of his top engineers, Adam Bosworth, who's really a rocket scientist, were on stage at, at, at the end, and I was interviewing them about what they mean. And basically, they think that any signal, any digital signal, is essentially part of the Internet of Things in the way they're describing it. And this is an article about an announcement they did with Microsoft to do a deal regarding Office 365, where when a person who's buying Office 365 or owns it already is using the product and has problems or doesn't use it correctly, or whatever they do gets recorded and stored into a database in Salesforce applied software to help Microsoft understand what is going on with their product. And they think of that signal of the user of Office 365 opening a, a spreadsheet the wrong way or whatever as as much part of the Internet of Things as a you know, signal coming off of a fire alarm that you got smoke in your house. I think that's a very useful way to think about what's really going on. It, it's too narrow to think of the things as the central issue with the Internet of Things. And so I want to take it even a step further because it gets really exciting. It, it is exciting, obviously, but it's going to get weird. And the reason I'm showing you these prairie dogs is just to show that when we start measuring things and recording them and putting them in databases and then applying analytics to that, we are really going to figure out a lot of things we never guessed. There is a study being done right now that's quite advanced where they, they take a prairie dog colony and they have gigantic listening devices all around the periphery of it and then they conduct experiments like they let a dog run through the prairie dog colony or they have a woman walk through and a man walk through, or a man with a red jacket or a man with a blue jacket, and the prairie dogs make different noises when everything happens. And prairie dogs happen to be among the more vocal of animals. And they're recording, and then they're uh, correlating, and they really believe they're going to be able to understand prairie dog language. So think of it. We're going to be able to talk to animals. I'm not shitting you. That is happening. And, and so another one that I just read about in the last couple of weeks is doing the same thing with babies' facial expressions, correlating all kinds of indicators of their health and their behavior with how they smile, what they do. So we'll probably be able to communicate better with babies, too. I don't know what that's going to mean. But it's going to be different. It's going to be more efficient in all the things we do day in and day out. But we're going to have capabilities we never imagined were possible. And the, the thing that I also want to mention, sort of stepping back at looking at the big picture, um, one of the sessions we had at Techonomy was about the values behind algorithms. 
uh, that are defining so much of our lives. And that was a really interesting discussion. And one of the things that came out was, well, you know, you know, these algorithms have a life of their own. You can't stop them. That was really interesting. Um, and, but one of the panelists, you know, somebody raised their hand and said, you know, but I, I, this all makes me very uncomfortable. What if I don't want to live in that world? And somebody on the panel said, you can always opt out, not, not use the systems. You don't have to be on Facebook. You don't, but the reality is that is not true. And a friend of mine started a dialogue on Facebook just this week based on her having been in the audience at that session asking a bunch of her friends, did they think you really could opt out? And it was interesting how universal was the view that you cannot, and most people saying you should not. Um, Robert Scoble, the great tech pundit and, and writer, was ta telling a story about how he was on an airplane leaving the gate at O'Hare, uh, and he got an alert on an app on his phone that his flight was canceled and did he want to rebook? Because he's a superpower, you know, you know, early adopter. And so he did, and he got a seat on a plane that only had like three seats, and this was before the pilot had announced to the passengers that the flight was canceled. He got it on his app before the plane stopped taxiing out to the runway. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. And he was saying, I don't want to opt out of that. But in any case, we can't opt out. We are surrounded by sensors. We're surrounded by analytics. We're surrounded by measurement and cameras. And, you know, better or worse, that's the world we're in. So how do we make that world better? And I do think as technologists, all of us have to take that challenge seriously. It is not just about you know, making things more efficient and throwing caution to the winds. We have to apply human values to this world because it is very complex, has huge implications for our morality, for what we think is right and wrong, for all kinds of you know, decision-making processes that historically have happened at a much slower rate, but that really now we have to recognize almost have to be instantiated in software. So if those decisions are in software, what are the values that those algorithms have? And I just want to give an example of somebody I know who's really thinking hard about this, Nicholas Negroponte, one of the great leaders of tech, who founded Wired Magazine and all kinds of other cool stuff, and the Media Lab at MIT. His big campaign right now is that the internet ought to be a human right. And, and I think for most of us, we would accept that as a given, but uh, in most of the world right now, that is not a given, and there's plenty of countries that think that really they should dole out internet access as the government sees fit. Uh, you might have noticed this week that in the effort to try to shut down Facebook and Viber and I think WhatsApp, the government of Bangladesh accidentally shut off the entire internet for like an hour. Um, and you know they, they should definitely not be shutting off Facebook and Viber either, uh, but that's routine now in a lot of countries. And, and that's not exactly what Nicholas is talking about, but it's part of it. And his point is that if people all over the world don't have access to this tool that we take for granted, they are going to be dramatically deprived compared to us, and that's getting more so every day. I just want to have, I have two slides here that are just tipping my hat to things that I don't want you to think that I don't think about. One is this issue of privacy and how we respect the data of the users. We've got to be thinking about that all the time. I happen to love this sentence that I heard recently, um, but you know, people care about what happens with their data and you know that. And then the other one is, okay, what's gonna happen to what we do? Uh, McKinsey did a study just recently where they sort of reassured us, it was a very sophisticated study of the future of employment in the United States. And they found that probably no more than 6% of jobs will go away completely in the next decade because of automation. That was good news. However, they also found, and they documented this quite thoroughly, that literally every job, or maybe not literally every job, but almost literally every job, including the job of CEOs, would see typically at least 30% of what it includes today automated. Okay, so if every one of us is going to see 30% at least of what we do now automated, what happens to that 30%? Do we get to do more sophisticated creative work that makes us more satisfied, or does our company cut 30% of the people? Nobody knows. It's something we've got to think about. This is a big challenge that is an unknown world that we're entering into, and actually, you know, it has a lot to do with this whole challenge of income inequality and a lot of other things. This is my final slide. And I don't, does anybody here, if you just take a quick look, second to look at this, I know it's a lot of words. Does anybody know what this slide is? 
It's from Mark Zuckerberg's letter to his daughter that came out two days ago. It's quite moving, really. You know, in the context of promising to give away basically all his money over the course of his lifetime, he was talking about his values. And, you know, for me, I was not surprised to learn that these are some of his values. But look at some of the things that he's saying he cares about. He's going to spend his $45 billion and growing on even as he intends to stay CEO of, sales, of Facebook for the indefinite future. And he doesn't plan to leave, by the way. He wants to advance human potential, push the boundaries of how great a human life can be. He wants to uh, allow us to learn 100 times faster. And by the way, there are a lot of people who think virtual reality systems that allow us to be completely immersed into an environment that can be completely controlled could allow us to learn things with incredible speed. I heard a guy last year talking about his belief that when you incorporate a lot of understanding of neuroscience and psychology into the design of virtual reality systems, we may be able to learn a foreign language in a day through some kind of completely immersive situation. And I think that's exciting, and clearly Zuckerberg thinks something like that is possible if we can learn 100 times faster. Can we cure disease, live healthier, connect the world so everybody has opportunity, harness clean energy, and then solve any challenge to grow peace and prosperity? I love the fact that probably the most respected global business leader, which is really what he is rapidly becoming, talks like this. I think we all have to recognize this is what great business leadership is and aspire to it as we move into this really weird mixed reality world. So thank you very much. I think we're going to take a few questions. I don't Thank you. Are we going to do a few questions? Uh, yes, we'll take a few questions from the audience. Or comments we have, are good uh, too. Microphones. Oh, we got we got some already here. We do. Okay. How oh, how will the workforce adapt? Well, I touched on that toward the end. Uh, you know, like I said, nobody knows. Um, I think it's a it's <laughs> actually I'm. I, I don't usually go to a conference starting on Saturday, but as soon as I get back to New York, I'm going to leave the next day to go to a conference on income inequality in Florida because it's, you know, it's gathered a whole bunch of amazing people, Tom Friedman and others, and I'm so interested in that subject, um, and it's very closely tied to the future of work. Um, one of the key issues, of course, is education and training. And uh, there's a lot of work being done to try to figure out ways to tie industry and the educational system more closely together so that the needs as they shift more rapidly are being incorporated in the way we teach. Because obviously we're not there yet where we can just put on a virtual reality headset and just, you know, press a button like in the Matrix, which is really what it's kind of like in, in, the, in these projections of the future. And, and learn what we need to learn because, you know, especially in the United States, people just simply don't have the skills that are going to be necessary for the higher order jobs that are going to be there as the lower order jobs are replaced. Although, one of the interesting things about that McKinsey study also was, uh, did I say the question, how will the workforce need to adapt to a world that's changing so quickly? I just realized you didn't see that. But one of the things McKinsey found is that of the 6% of jobs that are going away, it actually isn't the lowest level jobs. It's not the gardeners and the, you know, the uh, dishwashers as much as it's sort of lower middle class, you know, working class factory, you know, it's uh, office, a lot of office functionality. Um, in fact, the manual work is still generally going to need to be done in their opinion. But uh, how we will adapt, I don't know. Okay, here's another question. I mentioned Gates, Jobs, and Grove. Other than Zuckerberg, who are other visionary leaders that get it? Okay, well, you know, I think it's a very short list who get it at that level. And t typically, when you get it at that level, you also have enormous impact. Uh, I do think Mark Benioff, who is now talking about equality as a corporate value and did that for the first time at the Techonomy Conference, is a good example. Um, his thing of starting Salesforce from the beginning with some of the equity in a foundation um, that was, you know, to be given to nonprofits and to have a philanthropic model baked into the company structure from day one has been enormously influential. In fact, Google.org was modeled after the Salesforce.com foundation, so he really has influenced a lot of people. I think Benioff, who happens to be a friend of mine, is one of the great examples of that. I also think Jack Ma in China is somebody people have to really pay attention to and increasingly are now that his company was, I think, the biggest tech IPO in history. Um, but 
he's a values-based leader, but it's weird because he's in China and he cooperates very closely with the Chinese government. Um, it's, you know, I'll tell you an interesting guy who doesn't get much attention is Nicholas Zenstrom, who was one of the co-inventors of Skype and is now an investor in Europe. And if you've ever heard him speak, I've had the privilege of talking to him. This is a guy who was like totally Zen-like present with an incredible vision of the future. And you can see why he's been such a successful entrepreneur. Okay, another question. What industries should be the most scared of being disrupted? Oh, God. Um, well, what are some that you guys... I mean, obviously... You know, we've seen the music industry, the movie industry, and now we're seeing the taxi industry, the hotel industry. Um, we just did a piece in our magazine about shipping, you know, and how shipping will change as we have drone ships. We have a great picture in there of a drone ship that Rolls-Royce, which builds engines for ships, uh, uh, put together as a prototype idea. And they really do believe that shipping is going to be conducted by drones. I mean, like, 500-foot drones sailing around the world. I think it kind of makes sense. Uh, it's hard to name an industry that won't be disrupted. It's kind of the way we look at it at Techonomy. I, I think that the, the scare factor, it's healthy for everybody to be scared. Um, in a way, the industries that are most ecosystem-like are probably the ones that have the longest durability. You know, where there are more players with more invested in doing it the way it is now, and I'd say, unfortunately, banking is an example of that. You know, there's tremendous great ideas to do banking better, and the banks typically are organized very poorly from a technological point of view. On the other hand, they got a lock on that, baby, you know? And they got all kinds of, their people are in the government and everything else, so, you know, it's not going away any, any second. Uh, but then I was talking to one of the senior people here from AppDynamics about a bank that I happen to know a little bit uh, called BBVA, which is headquartered in, in Spain, that is really a, a becoming probably the most digitally sophisticated bank in the world. And you talk to them and you realize how different it could be. And they think they can come in the U.S. and start eating the lunch of you know, J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank America and Citi, et cetera. So even, you know, even banking, you, know, I, you, you talk about every industry one way or the other. The next game-changing technology, I do think probably augmented reality would be the one that I would bet is likely to be the most, the next big game-changing technology. Um, I think it's going to be interesting when HoloLens actually goes on the market, which they keep saying is imminent. Um, but, and you know, I think, I do think the Internet of Things has a terrible name. But it is, in effect, the next game-changing technology. But it's just sort of a, a, a phrase that describes a real-time software-driven planet. And, and, and that's the technology we're moving into. It isn't as much about, you know, the next really cool... I don't think we're going to see something... I mean, maybe HoloLens or something along that line could be the next iPhone that totally disrupts interfaces because, as I said at the beginning, we need to have these rectangles of glass disrupted. It actually is a very inefficient way to interact with data, to be all, especially if you live in New York and you're bumping into people on the sidewalk all the time now. Um, but, I, but I really don't think that's the way to think about the next disruptive tech. It's, it's not going to be... It's, I would say probably I wouldn't even see another Facebook-type company, regardless. It's not going to be a social network, obviously. Um, I think blockchain is the most interesting thing to look at, and, and Bitcoin to a slightly lesser degree, because in a way the infrastructure is more important than the money thing. Um, things that are just completely out of nowhere, open source, that reconceive fundamental systems of society, because that's basically what Bitcoin and blockchain did. And it's very interesting to look at the fact that the people who invented that don't want to be known. It's very probable that if that had come from a startup, it would not have had the impact that it's had. So I don't know the next one, but I'd say we're still in the early phases of one right now with Bitcoin and blockchain. So I think I need to wrap up, but I thank you all for having me, and I really, again, am so honored to be part of this AppDynamics conversation. <laughs>